as he brings the preached word this Lord's day. Our great God, we bow before you humbly, asking for your help. God, we pray that you would illuminate your word to us. God, we pray that you would help us to cast the cares of the world aside, Lord, that we would be able to focus on your word. And God, we pray that that anything said, Lord, that is not in lockstep with your word would be quickly forgetting, forgotten. And we, Lord, pray that our pastor would would stand boldly before you. Give him strength, give him courage. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Titus. We've been doing a study, if you're a visitor with us, we've been working through a study on the duties of church officers. So we've looked, we looked first of all at, at deacons and spent a few weeks there. We've been spending several weeks now on the duties and responsibilities and qualifications of pastors and elders. We use those terms interchangeably. What we have done uh, over the last several weeks, I've, I've put before you four C's to make it easier to remember perhaps. Calling, character, competence, and then we'll deal today with confession. And, and by those terms, we mean calling is, is the, the, the fact, theological fact, biblical fact, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the great shepherd of the church and that he alone is able to call men to the office of pastor, elder, overseer, bishop. Those are all interchangeable terms. And he does so by the person of his Holy Spirit. And the resurrected Christ has then extended his authority, exclusive authority, to the church, local church, and the local church alone to evaluate, affirm, confirm outwardly what the man has experienced inwardly with respect to a call to pastoral ministry. And and that that outward call is accomplished by means of evaluating several objective standards. So last last week we looked at the character of a man. His moral virtue must be consistent with the scriptures. And then in addition to that, he must have a certain degree of competence. He must be able to, to, to teach the people of God the things of Scripture, along with managing his own household well. So there were two skills that a man must possess as well. So today we come to the fourth of the C's, the confession of, of a pastor. And so what I'm going to do this morning, I hope to do it this way. First of all, define the term, because I'm going to use the word confession in a way that's maybe different than how you would ordinarily use it, uh, but it is the more comprehensive meaning of that term. And then I'll make just two points in the sermon, two, two sort of planks of argument, two points of argument. And the, the first one is this, that when we read in 1 Timothy 3, and we'll read today in Titus chapter 1, the phrase above reproach, that we need to understand that phrase as referring to not only a man's character, but also his doctrine, that his doctrine must be also above reproach. And then secondly, flowing from that, because the church has a responsibility to confirm men for the office of pastor elder, the church then needs some sort of objective standard by which that church can measure is his doctrine above reproach. We want something objective, something measurable, something that's not fluid and squishy and movable. We want something fixed by which a church can evaluate a man's doctrine and and discern, is it in fact above reproach? And above reproach, of course, does not mean perfect. It does not mean impeccable, but it does mean it cannot stand the test of, of multiple witnesses saying this is an error. There is a growing religious group that makes this statement. This will take this directly from their website. We believe that all Scripture is inspired of God. We built our system of belief and practice from the raw material of the Bible without predetermining what was to be found there. We align our beliefs with the Bible. We do not interpret it to suit ourselves. The problem is that that statement is made by the Jehovah's Witnesses who say, we believe the Bible. 
Now, of course, you, if you know anything about the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know they wrote their own Bible. And they have interpreted it in ways that are outside of the orthodoxy as the Bible has been interpreted by Christians for generations. So it is, I'm going to argue, is not sufficient to just simply say, we have the Bible. We have that standard. Well, the Bible is perfect, but we are not. Men are not. And so how do we, what standard do we use to help us as a church to obey the commands of Christ in these areas? Look with me, if you will, at Titus chapter 1. I'm going to read beginning in verse 4 and through verse 9. Our emphasis this morning will be on verse 9, but I'm going to make some observations from the rest of the text as well. The title of today's sermon is simply a pastor's confession of faith. Here now, this is the word of God. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. First of all, I want to define our terms. What, what do I mean by a pastor's confession? What do we mean by even the word confession? I'm going to quote here from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. If you're not familiar with that resource, it's a good one. Uh, it, 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 it takes us back a little ways before uh, some of the, the larger twists and turns and perversions of our language. In fact, what's interesting, when I looked up the term confession in Webster's 1828 they cite two scriptural passages as, as, as examples of how the word is used. But it just simply means to own, to acknowledge, to declare to be true, or to admit or assent to in words. And it's opposed to the concept of denying something. So when we say, when we use, as we ordinarily use the word, when we hear a confession, or some of you immediately think Roman Catholicism and a formal institution and the sacrament of confession. I don't mean that. Nor do I even mean only a pastor's confession of his sin, although he ought to be a man who has confessed his sin before God and sought to live by the faith declared in the gospel. But to confess simply means to own it as true. So when I confess my sin to God, what am I doing? I'm owning it as true that I have violated the law of God that I have failed in some duty or I have transgressed the law of God. And, I, and I'm admitting that. I'm owning that as true. Or if we confess our sins to one another, brother, I spoke harshly to you. Will you forgive me for that? I am confessing. I am owning. I'm acknowledging it's true that I have offended you. I've offended the law of God and I've hurt you in that process. So what it means for a pastor's confession, meaning what does he say is true with respect to the scriptures? Now, we believe that every child of God enters into the kingdom of God by means of a confession. This is the unambiguous teaching of the scriptures. In, in Romans 10, for example, Paul says this, verse 8, what does it say? So I'm at the word of God. What does the word say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because, listen to this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, declared righteous, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So every child of God enters into the kingdom of heaven by means of a confession. It's a short, it's a brief confession, but what, what do we confess? That Jesus has died according to the scriptures, that God has raised him from the dead because I needed him to die for me. Because I am a sinner and I needed that, the grace of his atoning work. 
every child must have this same confession. So the question that immediately comes to bear upon us is, have you made such a confession? Have you confessed Christ as the only remedy for your sin? Have you confessed to God that I am a sinner, that I have no remedy? I have no cure for this. That I need the grace of Christ. That I am plagued daily by an impulse that comes from within me to do wrong. I sin against even nature itself, what is obvious to even the pagans. I, I, I don't even follow my own rules, much less God's rules. And that I need someone to rescue me. And that Christ is the remedy for that. Christ is the remedy for that fallen human condition by which we need someone outside of ourselves to give his life instead of ours, to pay the penalty for that sin, and for the full measure, the full credit of his perfect righteousness to be credited, credited to me by faith in exchange. Have you confessed Christ before God and men? So this confession is necessary for every child of God. But here's the question that we have to, we have to come back and ask, okay, but is that confession sufficient to be a pastor? It's necessary. Sometimes churches throughout history have gotten have failed to ask that first question. Is he a Christian? But having answered in the affirmative to that, is that sufficient? Well, he's a Christian, and he wants to be a pastor. Is that a sufficient confession by which the church can evaluate his fitness to be a pastor? And the answer, of course, is, is no. We mean by the confession, by the term confession, what an elder or a prospective elder declares and believes to be true from the scriptures. It means what an elder must be able to profess publicly with a clear conscience and teach not only the gospel, but with respect to the whole counsel of God. It's, it's an indisputable truth from the scriptures that, that an elder must be called by God and, and confirmed by a local church. And that he demonstrates the, the necessary character, the necessary skills and gifts and abilities to fulfill his duties. But there's a fourth category of qualification that, that we, we are forced by the scriptures to consider. What does a man believe? And it is not enough that he says, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian. That's the starting place, but that is insufficient to bear the task of leading and teaching and shepherding God's people. We must ask, what does a man believe to be true? What will he teach? What does he believe to be true from the word of God? What is his confession? So I'm going to make this, this argument. Here's the first point in the sermon. An elder must be above reproach in his doctrine in a comprehensive understanding of his doctrine, he must be above reproach. Now, the question might come to your mind, well, where, does Tim, where does Titus say that? Where does Titus say that? Where in the text does this requirement come from? Does Paul say anything about an elder's confession here, in either in Titus 1 or in 1 Timothy 3, which is the parallel passage? And the answer is yes, absolutely he does. Look, notice first of all in verse 5, he repeats... This phrase above reproach twice here in, in Titus 1, verses 5 through 8, it's, it's twice. In verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. And then he says again in verse 7, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Do you think Paul is trying to emphasize something here as he repeats that twice? He must be above reproach. And that must refer to his doctrine as well as his character. Listen to William Hendrickson. He says this word used, this word above reproach, used in the original, literally means not to be laid hold of. Hence, irreprehensible or unassailable. Enemies may bring all manner of accusations, but, but these charges are proved to be empty whenever fair methods of investigation are applied. With the church and in accordance with the rules of justice, this man not only has a good reputation, but deserves it. That also must be true with respect to his teaching, with respect to his understanding of the scriptures. If a man says, I want to be a pastor, 
but he believes heretical things. He believes unorthodox things. He believes things that would cause harm to the church of Jesus Christ if taught publicly, if taught privately. Then he must be rejected. This above reproach standard has to apply both to doctrine as well as character and competence. Now, we can work this out not only because he uses the word above reproach twice here, and it's necessary when he gets to verse 9 to understand that that standard has to apply to his teaching as well, but we can also infer it from the way that Paul flushes out the rest of the letter. Notice what's happening in Titus chapter 1. He gives the requirements for elders, and then in verse 10 he says, for, or we might say because. Why was it so urgently necessary that men above reproach be appointed to the task of overseer and elder, men who are above reproach in their doctrine and in their character? Why is that? Because, he says in verse 10, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Now, what is the problem with the circumcision party? It's more than just their character. It's also the content of what they teach. He goes on, they must be silenced since they, these false teachers, are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. So he's saying there are, there, are, there are false things being taught. Now what's the fruit of that? Verse 16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. You see what Paul's doing? Bad doctrine equals what? Bad living. Bad conduct. It bears fruit, but it's poisonous fruit. But look what he says in in chapter 2. But as for you, Titus, you teach what accords with or what is suitable to sound or healthy doctrine. And then he goes on to describe the fruit that ought to abide in older men, older women, younger women, and younger men. What is consistent with sound doctrine. Then look at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You see what he's doing? Healthy doctrine, sound doctrine, will produce healthy, sound lives. That's what he's saying. So it would not be reasonable, following Paul's argument, to say, well, the, the, the standard of above reproach only applies to his character, and we don't have to be, we don't have to give a lot of scrutiny to what he believes. When Paul goes on to say, it's everything. Because if he teaches things that are unsound, that are unhealthy, what will be the fruit of that? What will be the result of that? People who are unsound and people whose lives are unhealthy. Rotten orthodoxy leads to rotten orthopraxy. Sound doctrine leads to sound living. So doctrine and godliness, you see that? Doctrine and godliness are linked together. And and we dare not sever what the Holy Spirit has knitted together. The Holy Spirit has knitted here in the pages of Scripture and ought to knit in our own minds the relationship between healthy doctrine and godly living. So we believe that the term above reproach requires us to examine a man's confession we must be above reproach in both he must be above his above reproach both in his manner of living his character but also what he believes and what he will teach now if you need more evidence of this i, I would give I'd direct your attention to 1 Timothy in chapter 4 paul exhorts timothy because we've looked at the last several weeks at 1 Timothy chapter 3 in which he gives qualifications for deacons and elders Then in chapter 4, he says, command and teach these things, beginning of verse 11. What what things? The pattern of sound words, the sound doctrine. And he says, until I come, Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and most of our English Bibles say to teaching. Well, the the problem is we begin to think that's, that's a verb and that's activity. But in, in the original language, it's, it's a noun, and it's a noun that's accompanied by a definite article. So it's devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to the teaching. Now, why is that an important distinction to make? 
Because not, Paul's focus is not on an activity. It's on a system of doctrine to which Timothy must devote himself. He must give careful attention to this. In his public reading of the scriptures, he ought to direct the saints' attention to those doctrines. And in his exhortation, he ought to direct his, the saints' attention to that body of doctrine. He goes on to say, just a few verses later, in case we missed it the first time, he says, practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Guard it, Timothy. Take careful watch over it. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And we'll look at this text more carefully next week, but Paul's making a profound statement that the very life and the health of the members of the church of Jesus Christ depend upon declaring sound doctrine. So it would not be reasonable for us to conclude that Paul, when he says above reproach, that that only refers to a man's character and doesn't really have anything to do with his teaching. Secondly, when just an honest, plain reading of Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, a pastor, an elder, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. He's not saying hold fast to the faithful word that he's been able to discern himself or interpret himself. There is an act of receiving a system of doctrine, a body of divinity that he, to which he holds firm and that he's a standard by which he's able to teach others and a standard by which he's able to refute and rebuke those who contradict not his private opinion, but that which has been faithfully transmitted and received by him, transmitted by others and received by him. So the scriptures point to a very objective standard for measuring sound doctrine. And so just as we saw in 1 Timothy 3 and now in Titus 1, with respect to those character qualifications, we said that for every mature believer, these things ought to be true. But for an elder, they must be true. And so for the writer to the Hebrews says to the whole church, by now, some of you ought to be teachers. That, that ought to be true of every child of God, that you grow to the place of maturity, that you're able to defend your faith, that you're able to explain those things. But it must be true. It absolutely must be true for one who would be called by the church to stand before them and proclaim the word of Christ. <coughs> So in that passage in Hebrews, if you'll turn with me there, if you're in Titus, just turn to, the, to your right, just a couple pages. At the very end of Hebrews 5, the writer here, the apostle to the Hebrews, says something profound. He says about this in verse 11, and he's talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek, and he's admittedly in, theologically speaking, some deep water. And he says about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to, under, hard to explain, because you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, listen to what he says, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles. This is the idea of the basic elements of something. This is the equivalent of the ABCs of any task. If you're going to learn any discipline at all, if you're going to pick up a musical instrument, if you're going to, if you're going to learn to work with wood or with metal, if you're going to learn how to, to, to program a computer, there are basic building blocks that you have to know. There are basic things. And he says, you need someone to teach you again the ABCs of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained or exercised by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. And he goes on and on. He says, we, that's our starting place. We, we, we have to, before you can learn to read, you have to learn the alphabet, but you don't stop at the alphabet, do you? You begin to read, and you begin to read you know, the short children's books. And you work your way up, and hopefully you've, you, you move beyond even those very first reader books. And you begin to read more substantial works. There's a duty to move beyond 
elementary principles of our faith. There's a duty to build up on those things, not because we forget the gospel and, and say that's not important, but that's the foundation on which we build. And the apostle says, this is especially true for teachers. But the critic will say, can't we just love Jesus and not worry so much about the details? Well, that would be like saying, I just love letters, but I don't, I'm not being on words. Words are just too much. I just, just let me have the alphabet. Or I like numbers, really big on numbers. I don't want to add them or anything. I don't want to multiply them. I don't want to see how they relate to one another, what they communicate. I just want the numbers. You see, to say this is, I just want, I just want the elementary principles of the faith. I just want Jesus and the gospel. Well, that's great. You can't go anywhere until you have that. But that isn't enough. It's enough to get you into heaven. But we are commanded to grow and build upon those things. And that is especially true for a teacher. So when you, when you read in 1 Timothy 3, when you, when you study for yourself the qualifications for a pastor, overseer, elder, when you read in Titus chapter 1 and you read about the qualifications for an elder, understand in your mind that when you read that phrase above reproach, it requires not only his character to be above reproach, but his teaching, what he believes. There can be no significant defect in his doctrine. Again, the standard is not perfection. The standard is not that he's going to know it all. Like that can be its own problem. The standard is the above reproach. Can, can a legitimate charge be sustained against him that he's believing and teaching something that is contrary to the faith once delivered to the saints? So why then would any of us accept a statement about the word of God and the nature of our triune God and his relationship to the world? I'll just stick with the ABCs. We wouldn't accept that. Why would we ever accept, I believe the Bible or I love Jesus, but I don't want to go any further than that? And especially, why would we accept that for one who would teach and lead? So it's not sufficient for any child of God, and certainly not for a pastor to say, it's sufficient merely that I believe the Bible. It's merely that I, that I love Jesus. You can't not have those things, but you must be willing to build upon that and demonstrate you already have to some degree built upon it. So that brings us to the second point. Every local church has the unique authority, the unique responsibility given by Christ himself to affirm a man's calling to pastoral ministry. A local church has that alone authority, that unique authority given by the risen and exalted Christ himself. And every member of that church has a duty to participate in that process. And the members must evaluate whether or not a man is above reproach, not only in his character, but in his doctrine. So then you need a tape measure, you need a scale, you need a ruler, you need some method of measuring, some objective standard to measure, is he above reproach within, with his doctrine? Does he, in fact, hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught? Is he able to give instruction in sound doctrine? Is he able to refute or rebuke or contradict those who oppose it? So that's the second plank, if you will, in my argument. A church needs an objective standard to do this. The church needs an objective standard in order to confirm that a man is, in fact, above reproach with respect to his doctrine. So what is the standard? By what measure is this done? What criteria do we use? Um, many will assert the Bible. We have the Bible. That is our, that's our only creed. Well... That seems sufficient for the Jehovah's Witnesses, isn't it? Is that the standard you want to adopt? Oh, no, we don't mean that Bible. Okay, well, now you've begun to put some flesh on your creed. Now you, you want to define what the Bible is. And then you go further, and the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, we proclaim the gospel. What gospel? Well, it's the gospel of a Savior who's not eternally begotten of the Father, who's not co-equal with God, co-eternal with God. In fact, he's a created being. He is a God, not the God. Well, we don't mean that. Okay, well, now we, we, need some, we need more skin on the bones here in our confession. To A.A. A. A. Hodge, one of the old Presbyterians, observed this. He says, the real question is not, as is often pretended, between the word of God and the creed of man. That's not the, that's not the divide. 
This isn't the word of God versus a creed of man. The, but between the tried and proved faith of the collective body of God's people versus the private judgment and the unassisted wis- wisdom of the repudiator of creeds. He says there is a conflict, no doubt, but the conflict is not between a, an ancient creed and God's word. The conflict is between what has been publicly fully exposed and tested and tried and true versus the private opinions and judgments of the next man who comes along. That's where the real conflict is. Carl Truman, by the way, if you don't have Carl Truman's uh, small book on called The Creedal Imperative, you, you, you would be blessed to read that and understand he makes, makes some wonderful arguments in favor of uh, confessions of faith as, as useful and, and necessary for the church of Jesus Christ, and especially in an age such as ours. But he, Truman points this out. He says, the question is, is never whether or not someone has a creed. And by the way, creed it comes from the Latin word credo. It just simply means I believe. The question is not, does someone have a creed or does someone hold a confession of faith? Everyone does. Everyone has a confession of faith. Even the atheist has a confession of faith. And, and if he tells you his is not a faith proposition, he's lying to himself and he's lying to you. It is a faith proposition. He has a confession of faith. Now, his confession is contrary to ours, obviously. He says there is no God. But everyone has a confession of faith. The real question, says Truman, is whether or not someone's confession of faith, someone has the integrity to write their confession down, put it in the public domain, and allow it to be judged and scrutinized by the scriptures, or whether he keeps it to himself and is not willing to disclose it publicly. See, it's a matter of integrity. Everyone has a confession of faith. Everyone holds to a creed. Everyone holds to a confession. You do, I do, all of us do. The question is whether we will give our attention to one that's written down or one that is subjectively held in its uh, thought form or maybe oral form. So what if a family member or a coworker were to ask you, you go into work tomorrow, and they're asking about your weekend. So while we were at church yesterday, and they said, "Oh, what's what's the deal with Christianity? I mean, what do y'all? I mean, what do y'all believe?" You just hand them your Bible and say, "Well, start in Genesis. You'll figure it out." What 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 do you say? Well, probably you're going to give them a summary of what you believe. You will say something like, "Well, I believe that the Bible teaches," and you will begin to explain to them the gospel. Well, you're giving them a confession of faith. You're, you're giving them a summary form. You're not going to just open your Bible and begin reading in Genesis. You're, you're, you're not going to begin reading in Matthew. You're going to summarize in your own words what you believe to be true. That's a confession of faith. Now, again, if the standard for a pastor must be beyond those elementary principles, the confession for every child of God to enter heaven is that Christ has died according to the scriptures that God has raised him from the dead as a propitiation, a satisfaction for the wrath of God against my sin. That's a necessary confession, but it's not a sufficient one for a pastor. And I'm convinced that the scriptures require of us an objective standard, a more comprehensive standard for evaluating whether or not a man who desires the office of elder is able to hold fast to sound doctrine. I'm persuaded we need an objective standard for that. And further, I'm persuaded that integrity requires us to have that objective standard written down so that everyone can read it, everyone has access to it, it's not kept in a private vault somewhere. That's what the cults do. We want ours to be as open and transparent as possible because this, is a, we believe, is a summary of the very Word of God. And the best way to prioritize the unique authority of Scripture is to have this written down in such a way that anybody can look at this at our document, look at our confession, and see, does this conform to the truth revealed to us in the Word of God? That's the way you protect and affirm the true authority of Scripture. So don't buy, don't buy into this idea that a confession of faith is somehow competing with the Word of God. 
or that a confession of faith somehow rivals the authority of the word. In fact, our Baptist forefathers added in the very first chapter, the very first paragraph, the very first sentence of our confession, they've added this sentence. We believe the word of God is the only certain, sufficient, infallible guide to all saving knowledge and understanding. Right out of the chute. So there is no rival to the word of God. Don't, don't fall into that straw man. There is no rival to the word of God. But a confession of faith ought to be able to stand the public scrutiny and the scriptural scrutiny. Is it consistent with the word of God? So from the scriptures, we need an objective standard of sound doctrine. And again, this, is, this, this ought to be true. This should be true of every believer, every mature and maturing believer, but for an elder it must be true. He must be above reproach in his doctrine, and he has to hold fast to the trustworthy word is taught, but the question now before a local church is, how do we go about putting together such an objective standard? And there are, there are a lot of possibilities, or I shouldn't say a lot, there are, are several possibilities. One is we just refuse to have a definitive standard at all. Now, hopefully you're already persuaded by this point that that won't work. I hope I've carried your conscience at least that far. That we, we, we must not say that it just doesn't matter or that we don't need an objective standard. We don't need a tape measure. We'll just eyeball it. How far do you get carpentry doing that? Your building inspector is not going to be thrilled with you if that's, if that's the way you operate. And how much more will the master builder not be happy with us if that's the approach we take? We don't need a tape measure. We'll wing it. We'll eyeball it. So let's, let's dispense with that idea. The, the second possibility is we start from scratch and we just write down what we believe. And many have done that, many have, or many have tried to do that. But if you haven't figured this out yet, the Bible is, is a big book. And there are a number of complexities. And when you begin to interpret one thing and you realize, hmm, that affects how I interpret this other thing now. And, and you begin to move one part and you realize, if I move this, all the other parts move too. If I, if I modify what I view about how I view the, the law of God, for example, well, now I've changed the foundations for many other doctrines as well. So we could start from scratch and write down what we believe, but there are practical limitations to that. Who here thinks they're up to that task? I don't. I'm your pastor. I don't, I don't think I'm up to that task. Uh, I, I don't know that you could take one of the best seminaries in the world today and take 10 men out of that seminary and say, we'll give you uh, 30 days. Write down a confession of faith that can be vetted against the scriptures and not contain any error. Because as has been discovered throughout history, even one small word can be the difference between heresy and orthodoxy. The difference between a God and the God is the difference between damnation and eternity and life with Christ for eternity. So the other option, and, and you know the rule, right? If a pastor gives you three choices, it's always C, right? If you're studying for the exam at home, it's always C. You adopt a confession that's already written, that has stood the test of time. And, and that's the course that we've, we've chosen as, as a local church. We have adopted and subscribed to what's popularly known as the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith or the 1689 Confession of Faith, which is kind of a misnomer because it was actually written in 1677, but that's a whole other story you can ask me later. But you're reasonable people, brothers and sisters. I hope that if I, if I make this appeal to you, uh, simply hear the, hear the word of God. Listen to the following passages. And, and I'm just, I don't normally do this, but I'm just going to read a string of, of, of passages consecutively. And I want you to hear how the Apostle Paul uses things like the faith, the teaching, the good deposit, and, and see if he's talking about something that's squishy and ambiguous and sort of self-derived, or whether this is something objective and public. 
is it, we listen to these passages, is it more faithful to the intent of these passages to start from scratch with each new church plant or each new generation of Christians and write down our own confession of faith? Or is it more consistent with the scriptures themselves to adopt a confession passed down to us from Christians who've gone before us? That's really the question. What is more faithful to the scriptures themselves? First of all, in Romans 16, and, and by the way, throughout Paul's letters, we find this kind of language, but we find it all over the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and, and Titus. But we find it frequently throughout his writings. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Well, how do you avoid someone if you don't have an objective standard to know who you're supposed to avoid? Because they say, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning, even Arius, the great heretic who denied the, the eternal divinity of Christ, said, I believe the Bible. He even was willing to confess the various titles in the scriptures about God, about Christ being God, very God. But he wanted to assign a nuanced meaning to those titles rather than accepting the orthodox stance. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. By traditions, Paul means the clear apostolic teaching. 1 Timothy 1 verse 3, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Timothy, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote, to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. First Timothy 4, verse 6, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Command and teach these things. First Timothy 6, verse 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, it does not agree with the pattern of sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. That's a bold statement. Someone will not do this. What's the problem? Pride. They're puffed up with conceit. And they actually understand nothing. Titus 1, 9, we've, just, we've been reading. 2 Timothy 1, Verse 13, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, so then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, Now we com command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. Last one, Jude 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. See, all these verses point to a theme of passing on, receive, or receiving and passing on that which is given by the apostles, that which is given by Christ himself. They speak of, of stewardship. They speak of tradition. They speak of receiving and guarding. A confession of faith that's held either by an individual or by a whole, ch whole church should, should never be viewed with the same authority as the scriptures themselves, but we ought to view it as a faithful summary of the word of God and worthy of our receiving it, cherishing it, and passing it on. So an elder's confession of faith has to be above reproach. The church, of course, led by its existing elders, has a duty to evaluate any prospective elder, to evaluate that man's doctrine according to an objective standard. So as you've, as you've heard the scriptures read in, in, your own in your own hearing. What is more faithful to what the scriptures teach? Taking up the pen and writing our own confession or receiving something that's passed on to us 
learning it, studying it, seeing does it conform with the scriptures, holding fast to that, expecting one another to be held to that standard, and being willing to, to contradict, to rebuke, to refute those who work against that or go outside of it. We need an objective standard. We need a, we need a historical confession of faith to ensure that a, that a potential elder or an existing elder is, in fact, holding firm to the trustworthy word is taught. So integrity requires us as a church to have such an objective written standard, and wisdom requires us to make that objective written standard something that we didn't write, something that we received. And a man considered for the office of elder must confess sound doctrine. And so he, I, we've talked about the last couple of weeks, he must have already demonstrated some measure of competence in being able to teach these things and contradict error. And the scriptures teach us that sound doctrine is defined as this pattern or form of sound words that's given by our Lord, by his apostles. And as I said, GFBC Conroe subscribes the Second London Confession of Faith. I was doing some thinking this week. You ever, you know, our, 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 our kids do this often. You know, homeschool kids are almost notorious for this, using words that they really don't understand what they mean, but we use them. But I'm guilty too. I've just never thought about it. the word subscribe. What does that mean? I throw it around all the time. We subscribe to this. We subscribe to this. What does it mean? And I did some work. I did some study on the etymology of the word itself. It's really interesting. You know, you, the prefix sub, you know what that means, right? Below or underneath, like a submarine is below the ocean. And then you see the, the subscribe, the word scribe there. You can reasonably, you don't have to know Latin to figure out that's something to do with writing, right? Well, beginning in about the 5th century, the English word subscribe meant to write one's name below the text. So if you wrote a letter and you, you subscribe your name. Now, when we think, hear the word today, subscribe, what do we think? YouTube, like and subscribe, right? Which means we can opt in and we can opt out at any time. In fact, I'm not committing to anything. You hit the like, subscribe button. You're not committed to anything. I'm, I'm going to get the notifications, but I can reject it. It's, it's completely up to me. I am fully autonomous and sovereign in what I receive and what I don't receive. See, words have changed a lot. In the fifth century, 15th century, the word became known as to write one's name underneath. And, and if you write a letter and you sign your name, I am attesting that what I've written is true. That's a view sometimes in a legal document. You will find at the bottom you have to sign your name, and it will have language like this. Everything above, I swear or affirm, it's true. That's the old use of subscribe. It wasn't until the, the uh, 1700s that the word became um, applied to a publication, like you subscribe to a magazine. You subscribe to a service of some kind. It was this much later that, that that usage came along. But it literally means that I'm putting my name underneath something, which means I am. Here's another one. We find this in Titus 1, another use of that same kind of, you see the word insubordination? Another, he's not under the ordinance. A child who's not under his father's command. Same kind of, of, of prefixes, same kinds of words. So for a man to say, I subscribe the confession, I put myself under it. I've recognized it as authoritative, and I've recognized it as true. As a church, that's precisely what we've done. We say publicly, we subscribe the Second London Baptist Confession. What we are saying then is, number one, we believe this is true. We own this as true. And number two, we are saying we are putting ourselves individually, our own private opinions, as underneath, subordinate to not because it stands instead of the scriptures as an authority. It doesn't. The scriptures are what the theologians refer to as the norming norm. It's what makes the confession true, is the scriptures. But then the scriptures become an authority, an authority to us because they are true. So consequently, any man considered for the office of pastor or elder must fully and personally subscribe the same confession of faith. When I was ordained as, as an elder, our sending church ordained me 
And I literally was asked to write my name and sign a copy underneath our confession of faith, saying, I will not publicly teach contrary to this, and I own and acknowledge and avow what is written here to be true according to the scriptures. So a man has to affirm his willingness to teach and defend all the doctrines contained, not every word, but every doctrine contained in the confession of faith. And he has a moral duty to inform the elders of GFBC Conroe if at any future time he discovers he cannot in good conscience confess these things as true. If in his further studies or he has a change in conviction, he has a moral duty. Listen to this. This is from Jim Renahan, and he's, as he has done the research and studied and looked at original sources going into our confession of faith and studied our particular Baptist, our Reformed Baptist forefathers, listen to what he says. Our particular Baptist forefathers viewed the solemn act of adopting, subscribing, and publishing a confession of faith to be so serious that they considered anyone who claimed to own it but practiced differently to be guilty of, in their own words, quote, the deepest hypocrisy that depraved mortals can be guilty of. Strong words, huh? To say, I own this as true with my fingers crossed behind my back is, in the words of our forefathers, the deepest hypocrisy that depraved mortal depraved mortals can be guilty of. Renahan goes on, he says, for them, confessional subscription was a moral issue. It was a declaration of one's convictions about the nature of the Christian faith itself, and so could not be taken lightly. To say you believe something meant that you had better believe it, or you were nothing short of a hypocrite. Now, sadly, I've known many men who fit this description, who have publicly said, yes, I'm confessional. Okay, do you believe this? I don't, I don't know. I don't believe that. Or, or well, I'm, I'm willing to accept that, but I want to put my own meaning upon those words. A meaning to words that would have never been in the minds of the men who wrote these words originally. That's an integrity issue. It's fine to say, I don't believe that. Great. But you cannot say, I don't believe that, and I'm also a 1689 guy. That's an inconsistency. And it's a moral issue. It's a ninth commandment problem. So no matter how faithful a man is in his character or how gifted a man might be in his teaching, he's not above reproach with respect to what he believes. A local church has a single duty in that regard, to reject him as a candidate for office as pastor or elder, or overseer. He must be rejected. He may be a fine man. He may be a fine Christian. But he ought not to be put forward before God's people if he is not able with a good conscience to subscribe the confession of faith that the church holds. It's a, it's a matter of public integrity. It's precisely because we want to honor Christ and his word as supreme that we must hold fast in this way to a pattern of sound words. So the question is, will we seek to be faithful to the commands of Scripture to guard the good deposit, or will we in some way diminish or dismiss those commands to us and decide for ourselves that our master must have been mistaken in this regard? This is not as important as he said that it is. It's really the question. Now, this application has to go further than just pastors and elders. Again, once again, this, this should be true. This ought to be true of every maturing saint. Not only those who, who wish to be pastors or elders. So are you yourself studying to make yourself more and more sound in the faith once delivered to the saints? Are, are you seeking to utilize the means that God has given, the means of grace, to submit yourself weekly to the Lord's Day instruction, the prayers of God's people, the reading of Scripture, the taking of the ordinances. If you have confessed Christ, which is, again, that first confession that must be made, if you've confessed Christ, but you've, you've not made that public identification with him by means of baptism, 
That's the next step. Again, if there's, if there's a process and an order to maturing in the faith, you confess Christ. He is my Lord. He's my Savior. I have to believe that he's died according to the Scriptures and God raised him according to the Scriptures. What's the next step to, for me to mature in that faith? Christ says to be baptized according to the Scriptures, to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, I've been baptized. What's next? Have you united yourself to a local church? Have you identified with Christ publicly before men by being united with his people in a membership covenant? If you've been baptized, but you've not formally united yourself to a local church, what's hindering you? What, what are you waiting on? That's, that's the next step. Okay, I've been baptized. I've, I've been united to a church. Now what? Commit yourself to the means of grace. Commit yourself to frequent, regular Lord's Day attendance and grow in trust that God is going to use these very means. We'll more at this next week, but he's going to use this very means to work out your salvation. It will help you obey the command to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To commit yourself to the ordinances of Christ. It says we read in Hebrews 6.1, are you striving to build upon those elementary principles? Or are you okay with the, with the, the little letter magnets on the refrigerator? I just like the letters. I don't really want to make words out of them. I'm just really impressed with the letters. He said, no, I want to build upon those. And I want to use the means that God has appointed for that growth. The reading of scripture, prayer, the hearing of the word of God, and the ordinances that he's appointed. May God give us grace and wisdom as a church as we seek to obey his commands. And for some, I hope today the first act of obedience will be to confess him before men to confess that he has truly died according to the scriptures, that God has raised him from the grave, and I believe today that God has washed me and cleansed me from my sins. Hallelujah. We are grateful for that. We will rejoice with you. The, the angels in heaven, the scripture said, rejoice with that. For some of you, the obedience may be, I need to be baptized. I need to be baptized according to the scriptures. For some, it may be, I need to join. I need, I need to pledge myself with a local assembly, it's, whether it's here or another true church. I need to, be, I need to join myself to a church. And others, I need to commit myself to the regular attendance upon the means of grace so that I can move beyond the elemental, elementary principles. I'm not content with the ABCs. I want to move on and build upon those things for the glory of Christ and for the good of my own soul. Amen. Let's call upon the Lord once again as we give him thanks for his word and as we prepare ourselves and respond to the word of God and prepare ourselves for the receiving of the word made flesh. <clears throat> our Lord and our God, we, we thank you, we praise you that you have made yourself known. We pray that we, with praise, we thank you, thank you that we have, that we've been given a good deposit, that we have been given a faith once for all delivered because we have a high priest who offered himself up once for all not needing to be sacrificed again and again and again. Lord, will you give us the grace to, to give ourselves faithfully uh, to your word, to our Savior, who is the, the object and the focus of that word. Will you give us the grace to persevere in believing all of the precious and very great promises that we have in him? And will you give us wisdom as a church body to glorify our head by seeking to be ordered in exactly the way that he has commanded us to be ordered and in no other way. Will you bless us and keep us, Father, through your Son, by the power of your Spirit.